Welcome to the GoTo Podcast. Each episode covers the brightest and boldest ideas from the world's leading experts in software development. Tune in for practical lessons, compelling theories, and plenty of inspiration. GoTo gathers the brightest minds in the software community to help developers tackle projects today, plan for tomorrow, and create a better future. Stay up to date with the latest in tech through GoTo's top-rated events held online and in person in cities like Amsterdam, London, Copenhagen, and Chicago, and by subscribing to the GoTo Conference's YouTube channel, where you can find thousands more high-quality dev talks. Learn more at gotopia.tech. Welcome to uh, GoTo Unscripted. We are here at the GoTo conference in Copenhagen on the second day. And uh, my name is Linda. With me, I have uh, Mois. Hey, my name is Mois. I'm a data scientist and very excited to be here today talking with Linda. Right, and I think we will talk a little bit about the concept of a citizen data mm -hmm. scientist. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sure. So citizen data scientist is a term coined by Gartner a couple of years ago. And it is described as a, as a person who uses or leverages predictive and prescriptive models in their work. But their primary uh, domain or line of work is not a statistics or analytics. So think it as a secondary persona uh, to add more fuel to your data science team. Mm -hmm. So this could be any person who has any interest in the domain that they're working with, basically. So a person who has an, no, no idea of uh, what a machine learning model even is, or how the data is structured, or so, but, but just know about the domain, right? Know about the domain, and obviously is interested to leverage no-code, low-code tools uh, to, to, to their advantage to solve the problem, uh, yeah. So imagine a doctor interested in uh, in knowing uh, what part of an image or what part of part of a let's say it's a problem of uh, diagnosing a condition uh, from an X-ray image or an MRI image, and doctor is interested in in leveraging uh, kind of data to to understand what uh, what uh, causes a condition. Uh, in that case, doctor would not be a data scientist, but would be using data science and data to to leverage the to solve the problem. And and how would he go about that? Because I mean, nowadays, if, if you are working as, as a data scientist, right, you you work uh, directly, you write SQL code, you write Python, you work with Jupyter Notebooks or, or even more advanced uh, technologies. So how, we, you can't expect uh, a citizen mm -hmm. data scientist to know all of this code, right? So so how how is this typically done? So in last few years, the, there's, there's a, there's a wave of uh, these tools that are called as no-code and low-code tools where you don't necessarily need to write code to be able to build a machine learning model or test a machine learning model. You have very easy to use friendly interfaces uh, that you can use to kind of uh, solve these problems. And you are even working on one, right? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, in 2020, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, I led to a creation of a project called PyCarrot. Uh, which is an open source, low code machine learning uh, library in Python. You still have to code. Uh, that's why we call it no code, uh, sorry, low code. Mm -hmm. uh, you still have to code, write few lines of code instead of writing many lines of code. But then you also have uh, no code tools where you completely, it's, the code layer is completely abstracted. You have beautiful front end UIs to work with. Mm. So these tools that you typically use as a business analyst, such as uh, Tableau or kind of these kind of yeah. tools? The target audience of these tools um, uh, originally uh, was thought of a business analyst or citizen data scientist. Citizen data scientist is not like a formal designation, right? You can be a marketing analyst and can be a citizen of data science if you are using data, uh, leveraging data to solve your problems, right? Um, but originally, you know, these tools, these, these, all these tools come with a story of less technical personas using these tools. But what I've seen over time in last few years is even your hardcore engineering and data science resources will also sometimes use tools like this to, you know, maybe configure an ETL mm -hmm. pipeline or compress a model or train a model. It's not, it's not only about uh, technical skills or technical acumen. It's also about these kind of tools are real uh, good, uh, you know, time savers. They are good productivity tools. 
Mm, exactly. So we are talking about this level of uh, abstraction, right? We talked, uh, we just talked about uh, before this talk. We, we talked about auto ML, which is another level of uh, abstraction that um, mm -hmm. has been been introduced uh, within the last couple of years, where mm. it's actually a machine learning code that finds the best machine learning code or, or model yeah. for you. So yeah. it's a model that finds the best model for you. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an abstraction level, which is making people free to do um, other interesting stuff than than uh, the, the low level stuff or w well finding a, machine, a good model is not necessarily low level but it's you can you can you can get more creative by having these tools of course yeah AutoML has been there for, for over a decade now mm. uh, we have seen the first tier companies like data robot h2o uh, and these products start coming in 2012. So ten years ago, right? Mm. Today, what we are seeing is the uh, is the second tier automation in this space, uh, whereby you'll you'll see that all these big companies have are, are converting uh, AutoML into like a API service where you mm. send your data uh, and target through an API endpoint. Uh, everything is abstracted; you don't see anything. Uh, it will get processed on cloud. Uh, and at the end of the day, you would get uh, the forecast or prediction back, right? Uh, and one of such model, and, and these companies, Google has this product called Vertex AI. And what they are essentially doing is they are building these forecasting engines behind the scene mm. uh, for other companies to use in their product uh, to eventually sell a product to consumer, right? So what we are seeing today is, is more, uh, more certain uh, certain automation uh, in, in, in these products. Uh, we have seen that uh, all these capabilities are now integrating uh, with, the, with, the, with platform, whether internal or, or purchase platform, uh, rather than operating as an individual software as a service that used to uh, a couple of years ago. So mm. now AutoML is a, is a big part, uh, I think, of, of every organization or will be a big part of every organization. Yeah, I agree with you. But also, also I mean, we are we're talking about abstraction and we're talking about people would no, not necessarily knowing what's going on under the hood is is using uh, these models and then there's also this other idea that with big with with really powerful tools you also have a lot of responsibilities right and and that's um, i mean you can still build uh, do a lot of wrong things even though you have these powerful tools because mm -hmm. If you don't select your data correctly, mm -hmm. if you if if you if you don't represent your whole population, for example, mm -hmm. you you can end up building a fantastic model based on your training data, but if that is not what your population in real life is going to be for your your app afterwards, then it's it's not doing a, a good job when you're then moving it uh, to work in real life. So. We, we talked about that before. If you have a, if you have um, a image recognition system mm -hmm. that is trained on the wrong data, like it it, um, it it might go out afterwards and mm -hmm. not being able to perform at, at all in in your target population if you don't make sure that uh, your data is correct. So even though you have all these tools, you mm -hmm. still there's still other other skill sets that uh, of course, we of need course. to. Uh, so yeah, AutoML wouldn't uh, prevent uh, stupidity at scale, mm. right? It's same thing as you can have a car uh, with the license, but you can still go on road and do the accident. Yeah. Right. So the uh, the the domain knowledge number one thing, uh, AutoML won't replace that. Uh, all the underlying uh, statistical correctness of how you sample your data, how do you prevent bias, how do you collect the data, etc. All that has to be, you know, part of your your skill set or your team's skill set. So, if you go on Google now and search for AutoML, uh, I can bet that over fifty percent of the time, article that mentions AutoML would also mention job security or data scientists losing job because of mm. AutoML. I don't believe in that idea because you know when Microsoft Excel was invented, nobody said account Excel would replace accountant shop, right? You mm. still need a person. I think AutoML is one of the tool in the in the stack of data science team mm -hmm. it wouldn't replace or it wouldn't uh, you know uh, uh, provide a supplement to 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 logical acumen uh, you still need to have that in your team. yeah i absolutely right? agree with you 
Yeah, I'm, I'm also don't feel threatened by <laughs> this emerging. Of course. But I think it's it's very it it opens for much more creativity because you can you can have people that actually work in the domain. They are not mm -hmm. as far away from from the tools as they used to be. If yes. you were writing C code or whatever you 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 would be writing, that the closer you get to where they can actually have insights from playing around with uh, the data themselves, with playing right. around with even with models themselves, right. they get much more uh, insights. And yes, they might require some people to help them finding the right data, making sure that that uh, that they're actually looking at in the right direction, the right models, type of models that they're uh, applying. Mm -hmm. But um, at least uh, the, the gap is, is closing, which is something that I, I right. really like because it also gives us opportunities to do something that's more fun instead of doing what what a lot of people have already done finding the best model for training uh, uh, for, for for recognizing images for example mm -hmm. yeah a lot of people have already done that so let's just leverage on that yeah another way to look at it is i always see data science as two parts uh, there's an art in that and there's a science I think science can be automated and is getting automated, right? Mm. The art part stays with human. Um, if you, let me ask this, would you hire a person who always write uh, implementation of neural network from scratch? Or would you hire somebody who leverages, uh, you know, out of the open source libraries like TensorFlow Fighters? I, I, I bet you do second, right? Because mm -hmm. the first person who write everything from scratch every time would spend a lot of time. Yeah. And you wouldn't want that as manager, right? So I think it's a, AutoML is, is, is saving time and giving you that time back to focus on things uh, that, that matters. That thing could be, you know, uh, engaging, more engagement with, with domain experts, more, more time spent on uh, identifying uh, new features or engineering new features uh, or even communicating or, or quantifying the value of project, right? The idea mm. is you do what as a human you're best at and let machine do uh, what, what machine can do better than you, right? And if you think about AutoML at a grounded level, at the end of the day, it's iteration mm -hmm. over a certain uh, set of uh, attempts in a space, right? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure a machine can do iteration better than us. Mm, yeah, I really like this way of putting it, saying that mm -hmm. uh, we have science and we have art. Mm -hmm. Because I've also, also, people have often identified our area with the nerds, that you're just being a nerd. Mm -hmm. But I often say that, well, you don't get anywhere without a lot of creativity because yeah, you, re you really need to be able to, to not just work within the box, but actually go outside of the box and explore. And, and you have to be creative, you have, you have to have the do the art in order to do something innovative, to do something in, yeah. in this area. And if you can have, the more tools you can have to help you do the standard tasks, the, the more time you have to do the actually interesting and do art. Absolutely. So I like Absolutely. that way of putting it. Absolutely. Also, if you think about it, like uh, we have been hearing this from a, from a long time that there would be shortage of uh, data scientists in future. I think there would be shortage of people who can convert business problem into a machine learning problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think so technical skills uh, will be shortage because the way we are automating and abstracting everything from car to a software to a washing machine, uh, I don't think so. We are far away from a point where uh, we'll be surrounded by abstraction. Yeah. I think the real shortage of talent is in people who look at, okay, I am having inventory shortages again and again in my business this is a this is because of lack of quality forecast so this is actually a forecasting problem uh, if i solve that i'll be able to you know overcome the inventory shortage problem so i think we have a problem here of shortage of talent that can identify a problem or take a business problem and frame it into a machine learning problem mm. and then collaborate and coordinate with uh, different pieces different teams and organization to make that project happen, right? And that's exactly what I think a citizen data scientist mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Somebody who is closest to business problem and can convert that problem into, you know, a machine learning problem, at least frame it, not practically do it, frame it, uh, quantify the value of it, convince people that we should solve this problem and why should we solve this problem. Yeah. I think actually that would also attract much more people into this area that 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 you don't have to deal with all the nitty gritty details of it that you can actually you have this abstraction level that you can deal with the problems and solve the problems instead. I think that would that would right. be a really good way to attract right. people. Right, exactly, right. I mean if if you're if 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 your company if you work in a company where you do not have 
motivated people or you have not taken business in confidence, you can build as fancy data science team as you want. You won't have any results. Mm. At the end of the day, you need to satisfy a business ask or a business problem and you need business to be in confidence with you. Thanks a lot. It was very interesting talking to you. Same here. It was a pleasure meeting you, Lena. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the GoTo Podcast. Head over to gotopia.tech to discover lots more content from the brightest minds in software development. Thank you.